Welcome back to our Craft Talks with local authors. My name is Sahar Vora, and I'm a tutor at the SJSU Writing Center. I'm joined today by sisters Anika Rana and Selma Tufil. Anika lives here in the Bay Area and is the author of Wild Boar in the Cane Field, which was shortlisted for Pakistan's UBL Literary Prize in 2020. She holds a doctorate in international education and has taught at several colleges and universities. Selma is an artist who lives in Spain. She has been honored with several awards, including a Spanish Order of the Civil Merit for her work in establishing international education partnerships in the art and design fields. She is the author of Konyansi, When Chickens Fly and Other Tales, a children's book. Thank you both so very much for being here. Um, now, my first question is about the blog that you both run, thelisten.com, which displays the lovely heading, Magical Words from Around the World. What do you think the importance of incorporating other languages into creative writing is, and how can writers balance that with appealing to global audiences? Well, I think it's very, very important um, because the internet is a world wide web, and we want our blog to reflect um, the global community. And so, yes, English is the lingua franca, but we, we want to have a, we want to set up communication so that nobody feels left out. We want to be an inclusive blog. So we don't want people to think, oh, if we don't know English well enough, we can't participate because we do invite people to uh, share their thoughts as well. So I think it's very important. Um, and by being linguistically inclusive, we can reach people at a deeper level than if we just confine it to a singular language, I, I think. And one other thing is that I, I was reading this Craft in the Real World by Matthew Celesis, and he, talk, he talks more about the craft of writing and how it is very um, focused on, say, the white male perspective. And Anika and I have talked about this a lot, uh, how language um, shouldn't, it shouldn't be English literature and then world literature. World literature should include all, English, Urdu, Farsi, German, everything. So we have uh, languages from many, many countries in our blog represented. And so I think it's very important. It is magic. Yeah, I, I, and I'd like to add to that, um, you know, as teachers for many, many years, many decades in different continents and being, um, having had the pleasure of being exposed to and, and acquiring all these different languages, Urdu, Punjabi, uh, Farsi, Arabic, Sp Spanish, you know, um, and me teaching in California, we seek out authors um, that are on the cusp of language. And they're not home, they're not, their home is not one language, it's many. And I'd like to share an example of a memoir that just came out by Sadika de Meher. Uh, the name of the book is Alphabet Alphabet. And she has uh, both Dutch, Pakistani, uh, and, and heritage, and a whole slew of other heritage. And in fact, the first line of her novel of her memoir is, my mother's vowels were clear as drinking water. She expected ours to sound the same. She was a teacher and the child of two teachers. Now, all of us included, teachers and children of teachers, we understand that. But books like this, um, which are probably not that readily available, um, reflect the thought that we have in the listen, that we all have something to say, we all have languages to bring to, to, to others. And, and as we read and explore other languages, our life becomes richer. So the listen is a place for to celebrate the richness of language, history and mem memories. So. That's so beautiful. I especially love that sentiment of finding a home in language. And, you know, there's so many languages in the world and that looks really different for everyone. So it's, it's lovely to see that there's an inclusive space for that. Um, both of you touched upon being teachers as well, which is another topic I'm very interested in. So, you know, you're both teachers who have now chosen to write full time. So how have your journeys in the world of academia and education within different languages, working with students who speak different languages, 
kind of influenced the current writing path that you now find yourselves on? Has teaching writing and arts, you know, as well as designing writing curricula, working with students, has that changed the way that you read or write in any way? Yes, uh, both of us started on our lives in Pakistan. Um, we studied English literature, which was primarily British English literature. And in fact, when we were in the master's program, and both of us went through the same master's program in Pakistan, um, American literature was a separate entity, which was fascinating. And we studied Frost and, and so on. And then when both of us came to the US, then, you know, then it was kind of more um, American, you know, US centric uh, literature, where British literature or British novel was a separate entity in itself. So it was, so we were very, very aware of this kind of, uh, language exposure in the classroom and also the languages which were missing. And um, at the time that we were studying, we kind of took for granted that what is documented, what is published is the norm and we will just go with the flow and follow those stories. But, you know, when I was first introduced to Babsi Sidva's work in the 1980s, that's where I thought, oh my goodness, you you know, stories about people that I would, def, you know, would sit and eat with and, and eat the same kind of food and live the same kind of life. This is brilliant, um, it, it, particularly in English. Of course, there's a very vast Urdu Punjabi literature out there, which I was also exposed to, but reading about the world that I lived in, in a language that I used in the classroom, as well as, um, you know, as a student and as a teacher, that fascinated me. And then more and more, and uh, being a teacher in California and seeing all the other languages that came to the classroom, I taught English as a second language as, uh, in many colleges in the Bay Area. Um, and kind of seeing my little, you know, I, I joke about this, that my, my uh, to my students, I would always suggest by the end of the semester, I'd say, can you now, teach me some of your language and the last essay of the class, focus on the language you bring to English and use the, the, the words that you think we should know and, and words that are special to you. So I, I do love collecting special words. Um, that's my thing, <laughs> uh, it, you know, a word and knowing the etymology of it and knowing where it came from and the feeling that goes with it. So. I, I, in the classroom in California, that's where I started thinking about what, which languages are not included. And so I would try and find texts which would include languages and cultures which are different from the norm, so to speak. Um, and, and that's by, been my journey, both as a student of languages, as well as a teacher in the classroom. And, and Selma's had, you know, a, we yeah. started together, but her story is slightly different. Yes, yes, we started from the same spot. But my experience with academia has been over five different countries. And each country with its own specific culture. So when people talk about mainstream craft, mainstream culture, for me that it, it's just impossible. It's a very superficial man-made or human-made construct. Um, and Whenever I, I read or what I'm writing now, whatever I create, because I paint as well, when I create anything, I try to zoom in on ideas and thoughts which are not considered mainstream, because I don't believe in mainstream. I, I don't think it exists. And then I try to bring those things which might be a rarity in one place, but not in another. I tried to bring them to the fore. And I thought it was, you know, just me, like when Anita comes to Spain or when, you know, we sort of, she laughs at how I point out things which are weird, which are not in the touristy um, guidebooks. And then uh, just recently, I discovered this Polish writer, Olga Tokarczuk, and I'm reading her translated books and she is, she thinks the way I think, and I, I say, Kanika, I found my soulmate in this writer, and I, I didn't know she won a Nobel Prize for the way she thinks. So she seeks out the different, not that she doesn't sort of go with the flow. So if 
when uh, in in this book that I'm reading, which is not really a memoir, it's more of a um, it's like a journal, and the chapters are vignettes. Some are small, some are long, but she talks about the human condition. And, and one chapter, which I, I just love, it's called The Cabinet of Curiosities. And she talks about how she prefers to visit storage rooms of obscure artifacts than the mainstream museum pieces or art galleries. She wants to see the deformed bones in some medical thing. Um, so teaching in these different countries has made me look at the world from multiple perspectives because like Anika, my students were Arab, Pakistani, Spanish, uh, American, and just, it, it helps. It helps you, you know, see the world from a different perspective. It's helped me a lot. I, so I just wanted to add to that, uh, which, which we've been pushing back over the last six months to a year. I, actually, I've been reading about it for quite some time pushing back on the idea of the arc and the hero's journey. Um, that's one of the craft related conversations that we've had about the stories that we write. Um, and, you know, when I started reading about that from uh, a writer's perspective, you know, I, I came across books about the heroine's journey. Now, of course, they were using sl slightly dated language. The book was written 20 years ago. Um, but more and more, we've been seeking out um, books and styles that are not um, the expected norm. And uh, one such by, um, novel actually, which, which reads like a memoir is, um, I'm just going to pull it up on my, um, is the memoir Above Us, The Milky Way by Fazia Karimi. It's an illustrated version where she's used photographs. She's used her artwork, uh, her memories of growing up in Afghanistan and being a writer. And so she's melded all these different pieces and I, I'm, I don't think there is an arc, so to speak, in the story that she tells. So when you, you know, re in relation to your question about um, has uh, teaching, writing and arts as well as designing writing curricula work and working with students changed the way you read or write, not only has working with the students changed, but even as writers ourselves, we've been every, at every point we question, okay, this is expected. You know how you get guidelines of when you write a good story, make sure you follow this, 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 this step. Now, of course, many of those steps are very accurate and we do want to have, you know, characters that are believable. We do want, uh, we, more and more we want people to feel the way, we want to be aware of what we want our readers to feel. So that audience awareness is important to us. Um, but we're also pushing back on some of those requirements. And in particular that the concept of a plot that's neatly wrapped up, we tend not to like neatness. Uh, at least I, I have a strong feeling of, I don't, I don't want things too neat. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating, especially this um, idea of pushing back against what constitutes a mainstream. I think that a classroom is a really good place to do that because you have all of these you know, thinking minds from all different backgrounds and each of them has their own idea of what a mainstream is. And so mm -hmm. that begs the question, well, what is a mainstream when you have all of these different versions of it? That's so interesting. Um, so my next question is for Anika. We touched on your, your book in the, in the last question, um, Wild Boar in the Cane Field, which provides a very law, a raw look into rural life in Pakistan. So, you know, we've kind of talked about it a little bit already, but what aspects of your own life did you draw upon to bring that story to life? You know, language, experiences, whatever it may be. And then how did you go about researching any parts that you weren't so familiar with? So I, um, both of us grew up, spent a good eight or nine years living in a village in Feslabak. And um, at the time we were not aware, I mean, like any child, might be, we think, oh, we're missing out on so much. 
it, it took distance uh, in time and space to realize the, you know, the wealth of experience that we were getting. And, you know, when you think of people taking gap years to go and live that experience, you know, then you realize I didn't have to take a gap year. I was living with family and, and I really experienced it. So uh, the scene, the space, the location, um, the feelings, the waking up early in the morning to break um, uh, jasmine or chambeli flowers to make into a garland, that was thing that was something that we did. Uh, long walks um, to the cane fields and being afraid of the wild boar. That was something we experienced. Um, so uh, and then being close to um, a canal, part of the grand irrigation scheme system that the British had set up. Uh, to cultivate this land, which was uh, originally belonged to the natives of that of that area, um, that was something that we experienced. We would go and see fireflies, uh, and you know, at late at night, you would see fireflies above the water. So many of the scenes were scenes that I experienced and knew about. The people I wrote about uh, were figments of my imagination based on the kind of lifestyle and the people that I grew up with. And so none of them are based on any person that currently exists or, or existed in the past. These were just people which are believable in the environment that I created. The research which I did, which I had a lot of fun doing, were things like the flies, the flies that tell her star story at the end of. So I did a lot of research uh, regarding mythology of, of flies and different religious perspectives about flies, and then the biology of the flies. And, um, and the same thing with uh, the wild boar. I had not, even though, you know, as a child I had. I originally, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, a medical doctor versus an educational doctor. And so I had studied pre-medical science. So I was aware of some biology and some of the sciences. And, and so going back to understand, um, you know, how wild boar, reading papers on what are the characteristics of boar in South Asia versus other countries and why do they behave in certain ways? Why do they attack humans? They usually only attack humans when they feel like most animals, when they feel that their um, uh, offspring are in danger or they are in danger. So, you know, doing all of that research that, you know, that the, the the internet provides all those academic papers. That I had a lot of fun doing that academic research. Um, but as far as the experience and the the location, that and and even the death of a buffalo, um, that was something that we witnessed. And the pain of when I say that. Let me take you back. I, I, I mis, I'm misquoting here. Um, in the book, I have the sacrifice of a buffalo. The the um, that that's different. Um, but on that farm that we grew up, we actually witnessed the death of a buffalo, which is extremely different concept and the feelings behind that versus the celebration of Eid and the sacrifice of um, the buffalo. Actually, what's the word that we, we use here? We don't use the word sacrifice, but I can't think of the- Slaughter. The... Slaughter? Slaughter, yes, that's what that be. Or there's another word as well. But anyway, sorry about that. Going off on tangents. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. That's really illuminating. Um, it's just, I find it so interesting, you know, researching something like a fly, the biology and you know the things that a fly does, it's just one of those black holes that you fall into and you never know, you know, who's going to be reading this or what, who's, what's, you know, going to be taken from that. Exactly. With the eyes, as in the vision of, an, of a fly, how does a fly see? And even the, the, the lifespan, that was fascinating too, because the concept for me was, you know, how important it, realizing, and both of us had just read Harari's um, Sapiens, and the, the realization that as human beings, our lifespan is kind of like a fly's lifespan <laughs> in the larger scheme of things. Uh, so that's kind of the cynic in me that, um, yeah, it was, it was fun. Yeah, I, I bet it was. <laughs> um, so this is kind of on a different 
talk, but um, so Salma, you kind of described your collection of short stories, Konyansi, When Chickens Fly, and Other Tales, as being written for children, but with an added depth that adults can appreciate. So how did you approach the writing process for these stories, you know, keeping in mind that top, these were topics that could be read by multiple different age groups? Well, the idea came from a class I was teaching at uh, OSHA Lifelong Learning at the University of California in Irvine. And I, I called this class Tracing Movements of Human Understanding. And we looked at myths and legends and fairy tales from around the world. And we analyzed um, what the narratives revealed about the group of people where these fairy tales and legends were popular. And because it's the lifelong learning, I had a lot of very mature students. The eldest one was about 92. Wow. And the conversations were fascinating. I, I just loved it. But as I was teaching this class, and as we were looking through these, these primata, because one of my master's degree is linguistics. And I thought, okay, what do I want to, um, what message do I want in my stories? So I created these tales to embed what I thought is relevant for the 21st century. And as I was doing research for this class, I discovered um, Iktomi, the trickster spider in Native American legends. And that was a way to teach people how not, you know, how to be in that, the community of Native Americans. So I chose that um, blueprint, so to speak. And my spider is called Yancy. And it's a play on Spanish, con Yancy, because he's a confidence trickster, but it's with Yancy. And he tries to trick the characters in the 10 different stories. And the issues are about immigration, about uh, when chickens fly is about a little chick who wants to fly like a seagull, um, you know. So it was about feminism, empowerment. Um, so the story on a superficial level is about this nasty little spider who's trying to trick people to do things so that you know uh, he can take advantage of them. But underlying that is the message. So maybe 200 years from now, somebody finds this book and they say, oh, in the 21st century, these were the schemata in the tales that were um, in this. So the, the, the book is really for children between ages of eight and 12. And uh, it's printed for children but I'm sure if an adult reads them, they will, they will know what's behind them. Yeah, it also sounds like uh, the sort of book where, you know, if you do multiple rereadings throughout the years, like the first time you encounter is when you're eight and then you read it again when you're 12 and then you read it again when you're 18, read it again when you're 30, it probably would take on, you know, new and multiple layered meanings. I find it's, that exactly. it's like The Little Prince. I first read it when I was 10 and I read it recently in Spanish and it had a very different meaning. And um, yeah, and, and also these tales have been translated into Spanish and it, in Urdu. Oh, wonderful. So I, I wanted to just share these ideas with, in multiple languages. And, and the ending of, of that book includes um, a whole series of being the teacher that she is. Um, guidelines on how others can also write, uh, the artist and the teacher. So all of the art is her own illustration. Um, so yeah, so so it's kind of one of the, like the books that they used to have back in the day where, you know, what ending do you want? Uh, yeah. in, in this case, it's not what ending do you want? How do you want to contribute to the world of art and, and storytelling? Yeah. Great. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying, yes, I didn't okay. mention that, but it is, yeah, you can't take the teacher out of the teacher. <laughs> well, as you are both teachers, um, our kind of last question here is, what advice would you give to students on finding time to work on their writing projects and assignments, you know, when they're overwhelmed with all of their other activities? Salma, do you uh, want to? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what I do. Um, I. I am a great believer in these shut up and write groups. 
And because with the, the, the pandemic, it's difficult to meet up in person, you can do it online. And what it does is even though I have the whole day to myself, if I have almost every day of the week, I am, um, I've signed up for these shut up and write groups. So I know that at 6 p.m. I am going to sit down and write. It helps me be more disciplined. Um, and, and I like that discipline. So it, when even if you don't write anything, the two hours you're with other people who are writing, the fact that you want to, um, they, they ask you, what, what do you plan to do for the next two hours? It helps you focus. And then you have two hours to do something. And at the end, if you've done nothing, you can say, I couldn't focus. You get the support. Alone, it's very hard. And um, there's a saying in um, Urdu that a person alone is like one person, but two people are like 11, because you've got two ones. And I think being part of a writing group makes you 11 people and you get the support you need to do it. So that, that's what I do. Yes, I, I, and I'd like to add that um, also finding a thought partner that can keep, create, can, that you feel safe with. And so for example, once Salma and I have written something and we have others that we feel are on the same page where if we need a critique, that first critique of our work, um, knowing who we can trust where we're not and we're not encouraging to do things that we're, you know, that are going in a, the wrong direction, so they can give us positive, constructive feedback without those feelings. And, and you, there's a lot of feeling in what you write and what you create. And um, so making sure that you feel confident because you know there'll be many people who will tell you otherwise. Either they hate what you've done or they'll just say they love it because they just don't want to put that mental energy in to, tell, to give you the appropriate feedback. So we do this session where we read out loud and, and this is a good strategy for all writers is to read out loud but when we read out loud to each other we listen for things that we think oh I don't know why you use that word and oh that makes me feel kind of weird or you know I don't know but you know, but but we're comfortable enough in doing that. Um, and I also feel pushing back on expectations where you say writing is an isolating art. I really feel that for me, whether it's as a woman, whether it's as a woman of color, whether it's a teacher, I don't know what it is, but my need to have communal writing is much stronger than I would have anticipated. I, I used to think I would be sitting for four or five hours all by myself writing. If anything, it's been the opposite. I've been sitting with groups of, and usually it's other women, but it could be men as well. We, we have men in our group as well. Uh, or, you know, so, so um, finding a, a, a group of people that you're comfortable with that will encourage you with, with, and will give you honest uh, feedback and also connect you. And that was why we created the listen because we thought we're having fun. We know that there are people out there who want their work to be read by others. And it's just so surprising that in only three months we've had so many people who have sent us their work um, because they want to either hear their own voice because we've got audio recordings or they want to they want others to read about them and um, a lot of times writers especially student writers or beginner writers feel that need to be published they, they need to get over that first fear of being published and so that's why we thought let's create a space which makes it easy and we don't turn people away. We, we set up a Zoom meeting and talk to them about, okay, what, what, what do you want us to feel? What, what else, you know, and give them feedback uh, rather than just kind of letting it go into a slush pile of, of submissions. Yes, yes, I, I want to sort of emphasize that we don't, we're not there to um, say, well, this is our standard. If you don't reach it, go. If, if somebody comes and we feel that their work could become even better or we could say something more, um, you know, to, to help them, support them, because we have, between the two of us, how many years of teaching experience? I don't know, 60 years maybe. <laughs> but we, we've been, 
Nika and I joke that, you know, we all our lives, we've been on either one side of the teacher's desk or the other. And um, so, yeah, we, we do want people to share their voice. We love to hear what people have to say. I, I, I do, and I know Nika does too, because we all come from a different place. And the more we hear, the more we read, the easier it is for us to not be uncomfortable with the other because there is no such thing as the other, you know, it's just people who haven't stepped out of their own zone, so to speak. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, thank you for such, you know, sage words of advice. I, I think that that's something I'm going to carry with me out of this interview, and I hope that others watching this will as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for stopping in today. And uh, for everyone out there, be sure to check out thelisten.com for some magical words. And if you're thinking about submitting your own work. Next, see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.